lessons surrounding the idea of an upside down kingdom. As my brother prayed this morning, we are citizens in a kingdom. Citizens of a spiritual kingdom. A kingdom that is ruled by a benevolent king. A king the likes of which has never been thought of. Even though he was prophesied about, nobody had an inkling really into who he was going to be and how he was going to rule. Christ, as Christians, we have been born anew, raised to walk in newness of life by the Spirit of our God, and that new, new birth creates in us a new way of living, a different way of living than we have witnessed in human history. A new perspective and a new way of acting. In 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, I ask you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. I'm, you're used to me making mistakes already, and I've only been here like four days. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I have it on the, on the PowerPoint. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In this newness of life, in this new way of thinking, that goes even to the point of how we act, what actions that we take. Now, of course, Jesus in the Great Commission told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's point number one. Hear the good news of salvation because of Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. Repent and be baptized. And then learn even more about what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. This morning we're going to focus on not the baptism part, but the teach them. He, he said teach them, baptize them, and then teach them. In being a disciple, there are actions that we need to take. Last night I showed you this picture. And I ask you to think about this picture. When you think about a king, do you think about a servant? Now, church people might. But when we think of royalty, when we think of kings and queens, other people bow before the king. The king doesn't bow before his servant. That's how upside down all of this is. Because this is what exactly our Lord did. His actions, his actions happened because he loved us enough to reconcile with us. I ask you to turn to Philippians 2. Philippians 2 is where we'll read now. In the context of writing to the church in Philippi, there were Christians who, we, we can read in chapter 4, they weren't getting along. And the names of two ladies were mentioned there, Yodi and Syntyche. Earlier in chapter 2, he says, Have this mind in you, in verse 5, Have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, I'd like for you to think about with me about descending stairs. I have a whole lot easier time descending stairs now than I do climbing them. God. Jesus is God. Now, the first step, I don't think that I have a visual big enough of from being God to taking on the form of a man. I, 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 don't, I don't know that there's a step big enough to picture that step. But, and in becoming a man, you think, well, yeah, God, God should be a king, right? Well, he didn't take the crown when he came, even though he was born for that, like he told Pilate. He became a man. And then he was a servant. And as a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient. Now, you don't often think of kings as being obedient. They make the rules. 
And even if they break the rules, nobody says anything because they have all power and authority and they can do whatever they want to do because I'm the king. How many times in the Gospels did Jesus say, I'm serving at the pleasure of my Father and I'm only saying and doing what he told me to say and what he told me to do? That sounds like a servant. And a servant who was willing to die, and not just any death, that horrific death on the cross. And all of that to reconcile us back to God. Because you know in this big story in the Bible, the Bible is one story, and all of it points to Jesus, and, and in all of this story, it's all about bringing us back to God. Because what humanity did in the beginning was ruin the relationship. And in ruining the relationship because of sin, sin had to be handled. And how sin was handled was not like, it doesn't exist, dee, 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 dee. No, there is a cost for sin. And it's a cost that you and I couldn't pay. We couldn't pay in mass for the sin of humanity. God had to pay for sin. It's ridiculous. But in order to reconcile us back to the Father, you might say our king's actions is reconciliation and this morning my thesis is Christians are about reconciliation I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 there are two reconciliation passages now it might be true that some of these passages may not sit well at first now, we know they're in there, and Bible study come and folks say, well, yeah, whatever the Bible says, that's what we're going to do. Well, I'm going to be transparent with you. Some of the things that my king tells me to do don't always sit real well with me. But I'm supposed to do them because he's my king. But listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 5, beginning of verse 23. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift therefore before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. So how far is a disciple supposed to go in reconciling himself to his brother? Worship is important. That's almost an amenable statement. Thanks, brother. I don't often ask, but y'all amen so well, I got to get a man every once in a while because I go back home and it's a bunch of silent church mice. <laughs> I don't think Jesus would ever diminish the importance of the worship of God. But what he said here is, in the midst of your worship, if you realize that your brother or sister has something against you you know about it and you haven't done anything about it yet but the pangs of your conscience tell you that you're not reconciled with your brother or sister he tells the disciple that the disciple is the one who is responsible to go too many people use conflict scenarios like this within a power scenario there's a reason last night came last night they use the scenario by saying, well, if she thinks I'm so wrong, she's supposed to come to me. Right? I'm not talking to her till she, till she apologizes. Or even worse, after apologies are said, we, don't, we may not say it out loud, but we holding on to that one. Because there might be a time in the future when I might could use that for my benefit. And y'all are chuckling out there because you know humans, right? Y'all know humans because you stare at one in the morning, in the mirror. That's how fleshly people think and act. And that's sometimes how we're tempted to act because we know power scenarios like that are important to fleshly people. Praise God, we serve a God, and we have a God who loves us, 
and to not use our sin as a power trip. He sought first to reconcile to us. His reconciliation is so important because he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't set the bar too high. And he came so that we could be reconciled to him. He came for me, and he came for you, and he came for them. He came. Praise be to the God of heaven. So we have this first passage here in Matthew chapter 5. Well, then we have another passage in Matthew chapter 18. You might know this one a little bit better. I'm going to read this as a Title IX passage. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell them the fault between you and them alone. If they listen to you, you've gained them. But if they don't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If they refuse to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, let them be as a Gentile and a tax collector. Let them be like an unbeliever to you. This is the clearest idea, and yet many today avoid this in so many ways. If you have a problem with me, if I have done something wrong other than mess up the PowerPoint last night, if I have done something that is contrary to what God says a disciple should act like, not only is my job as a citizen in the kingdom important with my horizontal relationship, if somebody else's, if my brother or sister's horizontal relationship with God's in trouble, we need to talk to them, which is the beginning of go and teach the world. Because we're concerned about reconciliation. We're concerned about people's reconciliation with God. We're concerned about our reconciliation with one another. But if somebody has sinned against me, I'm supposed to be disciple enough. You see, I started to say man enough. I need to be more than a man in a fleshly term. I need to be dis disciple enough to follow what my Lord said here in Matthew chapter 18. And if we don't do that, brothers and sisters, are we really the disciples we think we are because we show up at church? What Jesus said to his people is, if there's a conflict, you be the one to go. You be the one to go if you're the one that caused the conflict or you're the one that the conflict fell on, you be the one to go because reconciliation is important. And the reason these passages aren't practiced very much, brothers and sisters, and the reason they call us anxiety, and the reason is because it doesn't sit well. This isn't natural. This is spiritual. This isn't easy. But this is discipling action. Since God has gone to great lengths to recycle to us, when he could have just said, I'll cancel them. Where there is conflict, Christians should be like their Savior. Christians should be like their Lord. Christians should be like their King and seek to recycle no matter what it costs because relationships are the most important thing on the planet. Mother's Day is today. How important is your mom? If, if your mom is alive, do something for her because there's going to time when your mama ain't here. Relationships are important. We have Mother's Day. We got Father's Day. We got Sweetest Day. We got... We got all these days that trumpet relationships. Everybody says, nobody's going to care how much you work. Nobody's going to care about your cars when they put you in the ground. But everybody's going to, you know, we, we talk about relationships. But do we live them like this? What we're attempting to reconcile is more important than our self-worth. What we're attempting to reconcile is more than our vain pride what we're attempting to reconcile is worth more than standing 
You see, as king, he was willing to be humbled and humiliated in order for us to be reconciled. And if there's something our king asks us to do that we think is beneath us, I wonder where the problem lies. If we believe in the gospel, and if I think my brother or my sister is sinning, I'm not going to belittle them. I'm not going to talk about them to other people. I'm not going to subtweet them on Twitter. Since they're important to God, that means they're important to me. Therefore, I'm going to treat them as my king has treated them. If the elders make a serious spiritual mistake in this congregation, I'm not just talking about like times of worship or judgment things. But if there's a serious spiritual mistake, a member should not look to other people and try to get a council of people and go in mass and do, do a mutiny sort of thing or then throw them out. If, if the elders make a serious spiritual mistake, they are your brothers and sisters. They are your servants. Go and talk to them. They're real people. In, in, a, in a lot of places, people treat preachers and elders as if they're on some pinnacle somewhere that they can't make a mistake. And I know some elders who say, whatever I say is. We're all people struggling in life, trying to make the best. And some people use these situations as gotcha moments. That ain't Christian. Because we live to reconcile. We're willing to be humble. We're willing to wash each other's feet. Even be humiliated. I'd like to tell you a story about my grandfather, who I hold in high regard. There was a cantankerous old sort in the church where my grandfather was a shepherd. And the respect that I had for my grandfather about three weeks after I heard about this, you'll, you'll understand my first inclination when I tell you the story. He came in and he charged my grandfather, who was one of the humblest men I ever knew, with all sorts of terrible things. And my grandfather got up in front of the church and he apologized to the church. He took one for the team. And you know what I was? Mad. How dare he treat my grandfather like that? But then I thought about, and I have since thought about, what my grandfather was willing to do for reconciliation. Because if my father had hollered back at him at that particular moment, what would that have accomplished? If he'd have used his place as a pastor in a local church and his authority and got his shepherd's crook out and wrung his neck, how, how would that have helped? But instead, in this manner of judgment, he apologized. And it wasn't, I apologize that you're upset. Have you, have you ever heard one of those apologies? I'm sorry, I'm sorry that you were offended by what I said. That's no apology. That's a, that's a subtext. That's a subtext for, I'm just saying this because I have to. Please, brothers and sisters, if, if, we're going, if we're going to apologize and reconcile, let's do it from the heart like our Lord did. And I think back to that time, and I'm thinking, my grandfather was not an educated man. He stopped high school to work for his, for his mom after his dad died and then went back and later finished high school. But he was one of the wisest men that I ever knew and can think back on because he epitomized a foot washing servant. And I wonder, folks, if that's what we need to put out in front of the world. I love a good start shirt. I love pretty dresses. But if that's what we're known for in our worship services, that's flesh, not spirit. What people need to see in us is more than our finery. It's more than our integrity. It's more of this kind of action. 
This is the type of action that when people see that they will praise God. There are other passages I'd like to ask you to consider. When Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 and 39, You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the left also. And in a Bible class, there, there's always one at every church. Preacher, I got a question. When don't I have to turn the other cheek? I don't know who that is here, so I can get away with saying it. But in every church, you mean I got to turn the other cheek all the time? When, when don't I have to? And you know, there are some theologians who go to great lengths and say, this is a matter of... They, they, they do all this, and that amounts to when the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? Because when the Lord told them in Deuteronomy to love their neighbor, do you know what lawyers do a lot of times? Is they try to figure out a way when you don't have to keep the law, right? That's in Luke chapter 10 and verse 29. When don't I have to love others? When don't I have to be humiliated in the kingdom? Should one of the first responses to our Lord's teaching is, when don't I have to come to worship, read my Bible, tell other people about Jesus, love other people? Is, is that one of the things? Well, of course, that's America, right? When don't, I, when don't I have to obey? How much don't I have to pay on April 15th? Do you see how much we have to change the way that we think? When he says, turn the other cheek, he says, be willing to be humiliated. Because I wonder who set the tone for us. The indignities that our Lord took upon himself are ridiculous. And I know I keep saying that word, but that's because my vocabulary isn't very profound. The indignities and the humiliation he took for us to be reconciled to our Father is a teaching moment for us. And if the first thought in our minds is, when don't I have to do this? We need to work on our discipleship. We need to work on bowing before our King. But you see, even then, brothers and sisters, 1030? Okay. As Americans, here, here's, the, here's the American ethos. We don't bow to nobody. It's about my rights. Just ask me. Don't tread on me. I got me a yellow flag with a snake on it on my car. Don't tread on me. And I don't know. I haven't looked through the parking lot. If you do, don't hide it. I understand the sentiment. I was a history major. I'm not saying you're going to hell if you got a flag. All right, please. But there's something more important here. Because if don't tread on me is down deep in the heart of our soul, are we going to turn the other cheek? Or are we going to go the extra mile in the next two verses? Matthew 5 and 40 says, If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Roman law stated that a Roman soldier could compel someone to carry a load for a mile. And I'm told that there were markers, literal mile markers, like we see on our interstates, to show what would happen. Now imagine, a Roman soldier comes up to some Harriet or Joe and says, carry my pack. And they carry it. And then they keep on carrying it. What's that going to do to that soldier? Because you know, you know what a Pharisee would do. Drop it. Drop it at a mile. Why would he say this? He would say this because other people are important. And here is, if you'll pardon the expression, another metaphor from our Lord. Here is a cup of cold water that I could offer to someone to maybe get them to think. Yeah. 
for American history students, these weren't quite the quartering acts, but it was similar. And if you don't know what the quartering acts are, you can Google it later. But it caused a source of tension in the colonies before the revolution. But listen to what Jesus said. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We got more. You remember Paul said, If food causes my brother to stumble. Remember when he said this? In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 13, Therefore, if food makes my brother to stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. This is a very context-driven passage of Jews living in a Gentile world when in a place like the Corinthian market, there was meat that had been offered to idols and they went to a, a shop or a tent or some place to buy meat and they would, Gentiles would just buy the meat because what had happened to it before was no big deal. It was, and, and Paul was going, look, this, isn't, this really isn't that problem. He, he addressed it in 1 Corinthians, he addressed it in Romans 14, he addressed it in other, but, but notice it still caused problems. And instead of saying, you need to get your doctrine right, Paul said, you know what? Even if your doctrine's wrong, you mean more to me than the doctrine, and I'm going to be willing to sacrifice. Even though I like pork ribs. <laughs> Notice who is willing to make the concession. The person who was willing to make the concession in this passage is someone who knew the mind of God better than the other one. And he was willing to make a concession. Now, how does that fly in the face of, you can't tell me I have to wear a mask? Oh, wait, did I go there? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. How does that fly in the face of that mentality? You can't tell me. Jesus said, Are, is anybody else important to you? Now, you'll notice I'm not wearing a mask this morning. But two years ago, we had a whole lot of rights talk. You can't tell me. And you know what? Sometimes that's exactly right. Because you can't argue with a bullheaded person and tell them something. But, but Jesus, he didn't argue with us. He went to the cross for us. And then his apostles said, other people should be so important to you that you'd be willing to turn the other cheek, that you'd be willing to go the extra mile, that you'd be willing to change your dietary habits if somebody is that big on this. And then, two chapters earlier, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, these people were taking each other to court. And what he said was, you ought even to be willing to be cheated by folks in the church if they've taken you to court. Now, hang on a minute. Wait a second. You mean i got to let somebody take advantage of me? Maybe. Listen to the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 7 to 9. Now, therefore, it's already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do, you, why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know the, uh, that this unrighteousness, you will not inherit the kingdom of God? I'm standing for my rights. I'm right. I'm not going to let that happen to me. And I'm even willing to take Hank to court over it. I'm going to pick on Hank this morning because he's making me use his iPad. <laughs> Why don't you accept being defrauded? Paul asked, the Holy Spirit asked in a rhetorical statement. And the failure is they weren't family to each other. Like real family. I'm not talking about some of the families that you and I have been a part of or, or know about where families would take each other. Have you ever had, have you ever heard of families who go to court over estate things? Grandma Lucy died and then the, the kids were like vultures. Y'all know what happens, right? 
shouldn't be amongst disciples. Give her the butter churn. Give her the ring. Give her the TV. Now, here, here we go. Give her the 401k. We'd rather suffer and be defrauded by a so-called brother or a genetic brother or sister than to air our dirty laundry out to unbelievers. I wonder if this has any application to social media where we air our dirty laundry and we Yelp review all the negative. Am I willing to make a concession? That's why this sermon is called Citizen Action. And there comes the question. Well, Mark, are you saying I have to be a doormat just let people walk all over me? Do you think that's what Jesus did? He had all power and all authority and made the choice. He made the choice in the strength of God to lay himself down. He was not a weakling. You are not a weakling when you turn the other cheek. Now, some people turn the other cheek in weakness, in laziness, because sometimes when you turn the other cheek, one of the things that we might need to say in turning the other cheek is, may God bless you and open your eyes to what you're doing. I believe it was Wycliffe or one of the other early English translators of the Bible, as he is being burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English, he said, may God open the king of England's eyes. If you think Paul was a doormat, you haven't read your scriptures. God isn't asking us to be weak. Our problem might be that we're expecting our natural inclinations as American citizens and all the choices that we've made and all the rights that we've got and everything that we've been raised doing, all of that is going to be verified in the scripture. And that's just not the case. I know there's a lot of old folks walking around saying, oh, these young people, they just want a pat on the back. They just want a gold star. Everybody gets a trophy. You know who some of the biggest snowflakes are on the planet right now? It's middle-class white people. Because we've had our way forever. And we don't like the idea of sacrifice. And I say that as a middle-class white fat guy who has had great comforts and great blessings that have fallen in my lap. Please don't, please don't point your fingers at all the snowflakes around saying everybody wants a trophy. That's a very human inclination. And what we have to turn upside down is an understanding of what our God expects of us as his people. Everything that we've always done and everything that we've always felt and everything that we, all, we want validated is not validated by God. In fact, he says to repent. He says, your mindset must become new. And he didn't hide any of that because in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 57, as it happened on the journey down the road, someone said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now listen to what Jesus said. If you think he's a doormat, you ain't read verse 60. Let the dead bury their own dead. You go and preach the kingdom of God. And to another said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's not doormat. This is a king demanding loyalty. How loyal are we going to be? Because, brothers and sisters, if we have a but first, we ain't loyal. And Jesus was straight up with them because he told them about the cost of discipleship. He told them about what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom. He told us what it means. We cannot be his disciple. And we will not truly be his disciple 
when we first come to trust, until we first come to trust Him without reservation. When we first come to understand that we have to follow Him no matter what. Even if it means our death. Many folks these days have a keen awareness of our civil government and some of the same folks are worried about government intrusion and oppression and some of their fears may be warranted. But I think, I think a bigger problem amongst us, brothers and sisters, is that we expect everybody else to change and make our way easier. I don't want to have to put up with those people, or those people, or those people. I just want some of mine. And sometimes we expect it even when we come to church. I pray that you would heed your king. Not me. You know how fallible I am. But I pray you would heed your king and bow before him because he's the one that deserves it. He's the one that deserves your loyalty. He's the one that paid the price. What king would do that? What king has ever done that? No king has ever done that. No king has ever become a servant for his servants. And even that king, even though we are his servants, he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. He even raises us up to his level. And Paul did that too in Romans. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Notice how high, you know, most kings try to keep us in place. Most people with power and authority, they try to keep the people down. Jesus says, I'm bringing y'all up. Who is a God like that? And the answer is ours. Let us bow before our Lord and serve him as he declares. I appreciate your attention.